Okay, so welcome back to this video. I'm sorry for the uh, abrupt ending to the previous video, unforeseen circumstances. Okay, so uh, we were talking about synaptotagmin and it binding to uh, the normal lipid components of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so the C2A domain, once it has free calcium bound to it, it's going to bind to phosphatidylserine molecules, which are found within the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. Okay, so this here is a phosphatidylserine molecule, which, by the way, is usually abbreviated just to PS. Okay, now, so this is going to bind here, and uh, what we're going to see in a moment, we'll firstly talk about C2B also binding to another one, but what we're going to see is the effect of this is going to be to invaginate the membrane towards the synaptotagmin, which we know is bound in the synaptic vesicle membrane here. Now, a very important point to note is that uh, phosphatidylserine is not present within the membrane of uh, the uh, synaptic vesicle, okay? And if it was, it would lead to problems because the C2A domain would bind to that phosphatidylserine on the, its own vesicle, and that would be useless, basically. So you have to uh, have no phosphatidylserine in the uh, phospholipid bilayer of the synaptic vesicle. Okay, now C2B also binds to a lipid uh, in the phospholipid bilayer, and this lipid that it binds to is uh, potentially a more famous one than, than phosphatidylserine uh, because of its involvement in the um, GQ pathway. So it's phosphatidyl inositol 45 bisphosphate. Um, which is more famously known by its abbreviation, which is PIP2. So phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. And if you take the P for phosphatidyl, you take the I for inositol, and then P for phosphate, and then you've got two of them, so it's PIP2, PIP2. Right, okay, so what's the structure of phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate? Oh, sorry, 4,5-bisphosphate, that should be, because you've got two of them. So, 4,5-bisphosphate. Well, again, it's a normal phosphatidate molecule. So, here we have the long-chain carboxylic acids, and then you have a glycerol backbone with then the phosphate head off that. And then you take this phosphatidate molecule, so we'll colour in the phosphatidate molecule first. So, here's the phosphate group. Here's the... Uh, glycerol molecule, okay, and here's the long chain carboxylic acids, which are esterified to the first and second hydroxyl groups of your glycerol backbone. And then off of this phosphate group here, you then have an inositol molecule. So this is what you now need to link off this phosphate group or this phosphatidyl group. Um, so what is inositol? Well, basically, inositol is a six-membered carbon ring, so I'll draw it as a hexagon, where all of the members of the ring are carbon, and off all of those carbons, you have hydroxyl groups. Moreover, all the bonds of this six-membered ring are single bonds. So if I draw its skeletal structure over here, all of the corners are carbon atoms. You have single bonds between all of the carbon atoms in the ring. You then have a hydroxyl group of every single one of those carbons. And then the final bond of every single one of the carbons in the ring is a hydrogen atom. So it's an incredibly symmetric structure, incredibly rotationally symmetric. So this is inositol. Okay, so what you have is an inositol ring like this uh, bound to this phosphatidyl group. So what you do is you take one of these hydroxyl groups and you form a phosphate ester link uh, between uh, the carbon effectively and the phosphate group of the um, phosphatidyl molecule. Now, that makes you phosphatidyl inositol. It makes your phosphatidyl group linked off inositol. But then we need the 4,5-bisphosphate here. So we need to add more onto this structure. So basically, we're going to add phosphate groups onto the fourth and the fifth carbon. So we need to know how to label these carbons. So the carbon that's actually attached to the phosphatidyl group is known as the first carbon, then second, third, and here's the fourth. So we link a phosphate group off that fourth one. And then off the fifth, you're then going to have another phosphate group, and then it'll be sick from there. 
Okay, so here, finally, is phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Now, if you look at that molecule with normal uh, naming, um, the normal na naming protocol in mind, you would not name it phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. You would name it phosphatidylinositol 3 for this phosphate. I, you'd call this carbon here 3 and this carbon here 4 to try and minimize the numbers, which is normal naming protocol. Uh, however, someone decided long ago that the carbon with this phosphate group off here should be the fifth carbon rather than the third carbon, and we're stuck with the name. So it's phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Okay, now again, PIP2 is a normal component of the phospholipid bilayer, so let me draw it in here. So here is some PIP2 in our phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so here is the inositol ring, and it's going to be a little bit of a squash here. So it's got the phosphate group of the fourth carbon and then the phosphate group of the fifth carbon there. Okay, now let's color the different bits in. So in orange here, we have the long chain carboxylic acid groups. In green here, we have the glycerol molecule. Okay. Then with the phosphate group off the third hydroxyl group of the glycerol molecule, the inositol group then comes off that here. Okay. And then you have two phosphate groups off the fourth and the fifth carbon of the inositol ring. So that's PIP2 for short, or PIP2. PIP2. Right, and the C2B domain, when it has two calciums bound to it, it binds to this PIP2 molecule, which is in uh, the phospholipid bilayer, basically. So the C2A domain binds to phosphatidylserine residues, the C2B domain binds to phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate residues. Now, what does, uh, well, not residues, molecules. What does this do? Well, basically, what it's going to do is, if we get our picture of the, in fact, we'll draw it again. We'll draw a picture of uh, the docked synaptic vesicle. What it's going to do effectively is it's going to cause the membrane, the plasma membrane, to invaginate towards the synaptic vesicle. So let me draw the synaptic vesicle docked at the plasma membrane, and then we'll show this happening. Okay, so here's the plasma membrane. Uh, sorry, here's the synaptic vesicle, pretty obviously. And here's the plasma membrane. Okay, now we know this well now. So here's our synaptobrevin 2, and we'll draw two of these complexes. Uh, then we have our SNAP25 we'll do next, because it's easier than syntaxin. Okay, so here's SNAP25, providing two alpha helices into the coarse snare complex. And then finally, syntaxin 1, which then has this triple helix up here, which has MUNC18 or NSEC1 bound to it up here. Okay, and then we'll add it in on this side as well. So here is our syntax in one that should span the membrane so let me draw this as a plasma membrane here so oh sorry a phospholipid bile there so that looks silly now because i've only drawn one here right so this now is the phospholipid bile there of the synaptic vesicle if i'm going to draw a phospholipid bile there here i have to stick to that so let me get some color on this to help it out a little bit so we'll draw the phospholipid bile there, there in yellow so here in yellow is the phospholipid bile there Okay, and then you've got two of these, the phospholipid bilayer of the synaptic vesicle and the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. Okay, so there we go. Right, then we've got this protein synaptobrevin 2, which is in orange here. Okay, which is the V-snare. Then we've got this uh, SNAP25 protein, which supplies these two alpha helices here. So this is SNAP25, another snare protein, but this time a T-snare because it's on the plasma membrane. And then finally, let me just complete this syntaxin 1 protein here. Okay, and here is the uh, NSEC1 slash MUNC18 protein bound to the triple helix of the syntaxin 1. Okay, so now syntaxin 1 in blue here, and it has this triple helix at the end. Here's another syntaxin 1 protein down here with the triple helix at the end, and then finally you have MUNC18 or NSEC1 bound here. 
Okay, right, so the, here is nsec1 slash monk18 in purple. Right, okay, so what's now going to happen is we've elevated the calcium levels. Synaptotagmin is at... Ooh, whoops, forgotten one last member. Complexin should be on here. Let me just finish that with complexin here. So there's complexin finally in vivid purple there. Okay, so now our new friend... Uh, synaptotagmin here has bound calcium and what's it going to do? It's going to bind to syntaxin 1 we've discussed uh, which will help bring potentially this synaptic vesicle closer to the plasma membrane. It's going to activate complexin 1 so that it stops having this clamp function and instead facilitates the coarse snare complexes in bringing these two membranes closer. And finally, synaptotagmin is going to bind to lipids in the phospholipid bilayer. And what it's going to do effectively is it's going to cause an invagination of the phospholipid, phospholipid bilayer inwards. So the whole phospholipid bilayer is going to be bent towards the synaptotagmin here because the synaptotagmin is interacting with lipids in the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. Now that too is going to bring uh, the plasma membrane closer to uh, the synaptic vesicle and that's going to promote the fusion of the synaptic vesicle membrane with the plasma membrane. Okay, right, so now what we want to discuss is what happens when these two membranes fuse. The whole title of the video, but we'll do that in the next video.